I thought that was super cool and if you're not a gun guy you probably didn't appreciate the amount of thought that went into that and this whole scene overall the choreography everything was done really cool and I thought that was a really nice little touch to the scene. Welcome back to a highly requested video. In today's video, we are going to be breaking down Netflix's Extraction featuring Chris Hemsworth. Absolutely killer movie. I loved it. I watched it the first time. I had zero expectation and I think that's really what is the key to having an enjoyable experience watching a movie is having no expectations because I often find when people hype up like you gotta go see the new James Bond movie then it usually falls flat because we set this expectation for ourselves. So if you haven't watched Extraction make sure you go watch that on Netflix and then come back to this video because I don't want to spoil it for you so watch it first it's okay. Um, anyway without further ado let's jump straight into this opening scene in Extraction. So Chris is running around with his rifle, uh, doing some work here. Uh, I love the double taps on everyone. So one of the first things that I always notice when I watch movies like this, and by the way, we have mentioned this in part one or part two. I'm going to link both of those down below to check them out if you haven't already. By the way, for the guys that haven't seen part two, we're going to put a round through a vortex scope to test a theory from part two. So make sure you go leave a like on that video. I'm going to leave that up here. Anyway, as I was saying, I try and not find fault with movies like this the first time I watch them because I really just want to enjoy it. I'm a customer in that sense and I try and not nitpick the movie while I'm watching them and that's sometimes difficult to do but in this specific movie I really really enjoyed it. However in today's video we are going to be nitpicking if you will. So in this first scene one of the first things that I realized is you don't hear any empty shells falling on the ground. Now there's a lot of shooting happening there's a lot of noise but an empty shell falling on a round when it gets ejected out of a semi-automatic rifle it does make a sound. Now to demonstrate that I've got some empty shells back here. Let's hear what that sounds like. One, two, three. Okay, so it's a pretty loud sound, so you would hear that, especially with all the shooting that's happening. And that's sort of, in some of the scenes in the movie, we'll point that out where if they do do that. I think that's just the sound design people dropping the ball, but there's so many things to get right in a movie like this, it's impossible to expect them to nail everything. Okay, so right there, Tyler takes a sniper shot. Now, if you listen closely, if you're watching this with headphones on specifically, you can distinctly hear that sniper shot. Let's watch this again. Make sure you stick around till the end. We're going to be jumping into the ballistics of the actual caliber used of that HK sniper rifle, and we're going to show you why it's impossible to hear the gunshot before the bullet gets its target. So without giving anything away, the movie skips back in time a little bit. Tyler does this awesome cliff dive to chill sort of at the bottom of the water. I've done my fair share of cliff diving. Actually, here's a picture of me doing a stupid high cliff dive a few years ago. And uh, I really liked how they played off the fact that he sort of sits underwater and relaxes. And they tie in quite nicely with that at the end of the movie. So make sure you pick up on how they did that. I thought that was super cool. So in this scene where they establish proof of life for Ovi's character, by the way, spoiler alert, this movie is about extracting someone. Uh, you can actually see the bad guy having his handgun up to Tyler's head. And the first thing I saw, even the first time I watched this, is there's no mag in the gun. And I was like, how did they get this wrong? Anyway, Chris's character, Tyler, points this out quite promptly after the guy dry fires against his head. There's no magazine in it. <laughs> Which must still be pretty scary because there could be one in the pipe or one in the chamber as we'd say. Um, so yeah, but super cool, really cool scene and really cool how his character sort of stayed composed. And that was one of the things I, I really liked about the movie. The characters to me were relatable and I, I was into it. I think that's just, I, I enjoyed it. I was, I was super into it. It was, yeah, it was cool. Tyler's effectively being taken hostage. Two guys are escorting him down the stairs and a sniper shoots through a tiny little aperture and takes out the bad guy at the back. Now, when they show us the sniper's perspective and they're kind enough to show us what he sees through his scope, first of all, there's a few discrepancies for me. Here in the first angle, it seems like the sniper bullet is flying at an upward trajectory 
into the bad guy's head and when they show the sniper angle he clearly is shooting at a downward angle the other thing i don't like about how they've done this here especially here you'll see it as there it appears that he's hitting the actual concrete of the aperture before he's hitting his target now that would explain the angle discrepancy because that would be a deflection hitting the guy but really super risky in this case scenario because Clearly it's super light outside, it's very dark in that staircase, so you'd have no real way of identifying which target you're shooting at. It would almost be impossible to pick out the correct target. Uh, so yeah, I just didn't like that. And also as they showed again from the sniper angle, there's no hole or damage to the outside surface in that exact spot. You can actually count over seven bricks across and two down, and if you look at it from the outside, there's no apparent damage, so they sort of, just a little continuity error there. So the rest of the extraction crew are getting their gear ready and this guy actually inserts a mag into his Glock and actually racks the slide. And the golden rule of firearms, there's a few safety rules and one of those rules is you don't point your firearm at anything you're not willing to destroy. Okay, and in this case clearly he violates that rule because his muzzle is pointing downrange towards other people and he's putting a live round in his chamber. That's an ultimate, ultimate no-no. So as this bad guy is rolling up to a wounded good guy, G, by the way, also the director of the movie, he was also the sniper in the previous scene we spoke about, Sam Hargrave. We'll speak about Sam in a little bit. Um, but as the bad guy sort of rolls up to him, if I was the bad guy at least, or in a tactical scenario, I'd be putting rounds into that target, because as you can see, he gets really close to him, and our good guy's actually got his hand on his pistol pointing towards him, and he could have easily gotten one or two shots off, and that would have put your life in danger. So if you're rolling up to a threat, if your goal is to end that life, you'd probably be putting rounds into that target from a safer distance without exposing your whole body. So I think that was a little bit silly, but very dramatic. So without a doubt, one of my favorite things about Extraction was how immersive the experience was, the way they filmed it, the way they put it together. There's a specific action scene of almost 12 minutes, which feels like one take. It's amazing how they did that. They use super clever camera techniques, like this one where they come up to the door of a truck and later they would start the next sequence and just use that same angle and splice them together. And with that technique, they can make it look like it's a long seamless shot and it really puts one into the action and it's amazing how they filmed it. Now one of the other reasons they did so well is Sam Hartgrave, the director of this movie, actually comes from a stunt coordinator background. He's done some stunt work on big movies like Captain America, uh, so he knows his stuff and he really knew what sort of angles he would want to do because as a stuntman he used to be in a situation where he'd go like ah this is how I'd film it to make it look really cool whereas this case he was behind the camera and in some of the scenes actually strapped to the front of a car while they're doing the car chases to get these epic sort of immersive shots and I think that's, that's what made the movie so cool for me. It was really just this full-on immersive experience and, and I loved that about it. So this next scene I call the AD scene, accidental discharge scene. There's a few guys discharging their rifles slash handguns without wanting to do so, and I thought that's quite funny. In real life, it's not funny when somebody ADs at all. I've unfortunately done that, learned a lot from a separate video on that if you want to check that out here. Anyway, let's roll the sequence and I'll point out some things as we go through it. Right, so right there, Tyler grabs the AK, diverts the muzzle away from himself, he's got his Glock 17 pointed straight at the torso of the bad guy. Why run the risk of engaging in a fist fight with somebody if you could put rounds on target immediately, effectively, and you know you're not going to miss from this range? So I guess it doesn't make for a super cool choreographed fight scene, but yeah, that's probably a realistic situation. Grab that muzzle. The reason you want to grab the muzzle, I have never grabbed somebody's muzzle. Um, you want to divert that away from you so he can't shoot you and you can make bang bang like this. So a real operator will probably just squeeze the fuel off there. So as we go through the scene, make sure you count the number of times Tyler shoots his Glock 17 without reloading. Leave me a comment down below. I'm going to reveal the number at the end and I want to see who gets it right. So this is why I call it the AD scene. Immediately as he grabs that guy's AK, that guy squeezes a round off, it goes somewhere into India. And as he comes up to the next guy, he also fires his handgun without actually wanting to fire his handgun. And that's really what happens when you have your finger where it shouldn't supposed to be if you're not quite ready to shoot. Now during this whole sequence, you'll notice Tyler's actually gripped his handgun and he's fighting and punching people with his handgun and the whole time his finger through his trigger guard. So it's an absolute miracle that he didn't shoot multiple times. As, I mean, imagine if you're punching somebody like full force with your finger on the trigger, you're gonna discharge that firearm 
very very likely especially maybe if you're doing it once or twice you'll get away with it but if you're doing a full-on fight scene then you're probably going to discharge that firearm at some point so once again here he's got a clean shot at his enemy but instead he engages in hand-to-hand -hand combat which is not the smartest move so once again there doof, he full-on punches somebody with his finger through the trigger guard and doesn't discharge his firearm so throughout the scene, obviously, there's a lot of action, a lot of sounds, a lot of things happening. Again, one thing we can note, there's no cases actually falling on the ground. I just now I dropped the rifle case to demonstrate. Pistol cases make the exact same noise. Maybe not exactly the same, but it makes a noise. Right, so I'm going to leave the video pause there for a tiny second. Tell me if you see what's wrong with this exact screen grab. So in this case, the guy's discharging his firearm without having his finger in the trigger wall. If we look at this picture one more time, you can clearly see he's got his finger outside of the trigger guard, not pushing back on his trigger. I certainly missed this the first time when I watched it, but when I made this video going through sort of the fight scenes frame by frame, this is the kind of things we pick up on. But for the most part, they kind of blend into the movie and most people don't end up picking up on them. So I offer you a little bit of trivia that you may find interesting. In India, there's a countrywide ban on firearms. So the film crew of Extraction didn't figure that out until a few weeks before they arrived on location. So they had to scramble last minute. So every single rifle and pistol you see used in this scene, specifically this scene, is completely rubber. There's zero moving parts. So every time you see a slide go back on recoil like that, let me just pop this guy down. So every time you're seeing any sort of that movement, that's all been done with CGI. And in some cases, you can see the brass flicking out of the extraction ports on the firearms. But I think the CGI guy and the sound guy, there's a disconnect there and they haven't put in all the little cases falling. But I think given the fact that none of these are sort of firing blanks or airsoft guns where there's at least a little bit of blowback, the actors and the team of CGI people did a phenomenal job. And I'm going to be dead honest with you, the first time I just watched this, if you told me that those firearms were not even functioning, they were completely rubber, I, didn't, I certainly didn't notice it. Did you? Be, be completely honest in the comments down below if anybody knew that without having seen any of the sort of behind the scenes extraction stuff. So I think they did a phenomenal job putting this whole scene together, all things considered. So something really cool happens here. The bad guy grabs onto the slide of Tyler's firearm. And as that round goes off, due to the mechanics of the firearm, the slide can't reciprocate back, eject the empty casing from the chamber and collect the next round and put it in the chamber. So effectively, it leaves his firearm inoperable with an empty shell in the chamber. So then he has to fight a little bit with his handgun and then he proceeds to rack it manually on his vest. So effectively what he's doing, he's using the rear sight, hooking it on a hard surface and he's able to eject that casing, pick up the next one and get his gun back in the fight. So I really appreciated the attention to detail there. I thought that was super cool and if you're not a gun guy you probably didn't appreciate the amount of thought that went into that and this whole scene overall the choreography everything was done really cool and I thought that was a really nice little touch to the scene. So as they make their way up to the rooftop, Tyler Red goes for a reload. Can you tell me during this scene how many rounds he fired out of his Glock 17? By the way, the Glock 17 holds 17 rounds in its magazine. You can get longer mags, but he has the standard mag in. It's pretty clear in that. He fires a total of 25 rounds from his Glock 17. And that's something you see in movies all the time. Even with the fully automatic rifles they're using here, it's... People don't realize how quickly you go through a mag when something's fully automatic. And yeah, in this case little bit over what the capacity of the firearm is but at least they went for a reload. I've seen some movies where they do way more shooting before they finally go for the reload so this was a little bit over but yeah it is what it is. So it's shots like this where you see Sam Hargrave's action background. He's strapped himself in, he's got a camera, he's actually taking a tumble off the roof with the actors to put you right there into the action and that's what I really appreciated about this movie. The extra effort they went through to get shots like this. You really just can't fake this. It was it was so cool. And as they pan up to show you that they've actually just come from there, really, really cool. And for the little bit of filmmaking that I do, which is nothing, uh, it's making YouTube videos, I can appreciate the level of planning that went into something like that.
Now during the scene there's a lot of shooting into guys wearing body armor. Now I don't know if they're not having any plates in their body armor, they're just using the vest sort of to carry gear and stuff like that, but I doubt law enforcement will roll their people out without actually having plates in. Now if this video gets 30,000 likes, I'll do some shooting into body armor of my own and we can do some testing on that. Put a 9mm point blank to body armor and see what it does. So please make sure you drop a like on this video and if you have not already done so, I would really appreciate it if you considered subscribing. So here's an example where they actually got the sounds of the shell casings hitting the floor correctly. So can we just have that throughout the whole of Extraction 2 because that will just add to the immersive experience. Thank you very much, sound people. So our anti-hero has got his MP5, by the way it's also chambered in 9mm, it's a pistol round in a sort of subcompact machine gun. It's going to have a little bit higher muzzle velocity due to a longer barrel than on a Glock for example, but again I don't think it's going to make it through body armor even at point blank range. If you want to find out make sure you drop a like on the video and then I'll happily oblige. So during this last shootout, knowing what we know, they're using rubber firearms. Again, there's no shell casings on the floor. So just get somebody with a little tub of, of shells and just, you know, have them like flick it into the scene. And just that way it'll be, it'll be so much more immersive and it doesn't even cost much. So I, I do that for you. So on Extraction 2, if you guys need an expert shell thrower, just let me know. I can, I can do this all day for a small fee. So this is the scene that you guys really requested. There's a bunch of things in here that really play to my field of expertise. By the way, if you guys are not familiar with my background, I shoot professionally for a number of the biggest companies in the world. Vortex Optics, Modular Driven Technologies, for example. If you're not familiar with MDT, check them out, mdttech.com. They happen to be the sponsor of today's video. That's one of my beautiful rifles in their ESS chassis. So head on over to mdttech.com. Thanks guys for making this video possible. You guys absolutely rock. Now, the sniper rifle in question is an HK SL8. Now that's chambered in 556, which is basically the same as 223 Remington, which is what I have in my hand over here. Now I know you guys are confused because in the Netflix show Shooter, Bob Lee Swagger says that 556 is only good for shooting squirrels. 223 Remington. This bullet isn't powerful enough to take down anything bigger than a squirrel. Okay, we'll debunk that in a separate video. By the way, I just didn't have the time to watch the whole of season one of Shooter, but that's gonna be our following video. Hopefully I'll have some more time in July to get onto that for you guys. So, now given what we know about the 5.56 ballistically, let's assume the sniper's using a heavier grain bullet because he wants to shoot a little bit further. In my case, 223 Remington is very similar to a 5.56. So I shoot an 80 grain bullet at about 2,840 feet per second. Now what I was able to do is determine the frame rate that the movie is shot in 24 frames per second and actually count the frames since we hear the actual gunshot go off until the bullet reaches its target then we can reverse engineer that to get us the amount of distance between the target and the shooter. Now in this first shot, I've determined the distance to be around about 400 meters. Now the reason this is physically impossible to hear the gunshot before the bullet reaches its target is because the bullet is traveling at almost three times the speed of sound. In other words, as the rifle fires, the bullet exits the muzzle faster than the sound of the gun going bang can travel down range. So that's why you will hear the bullet hitting first and then later hear the gunshot, not the other way around. Now that is something I wish more movies would get right. The only exception to this rule would be if you're shooting subsonic ammo, but then you probably wouldn't even hear the gun going off because then you'd be using a suppressor and you'd be able to get it relatively to almost completely quiet. So in this scene, because they give us the sound of the gunshot, which we now know is complete BS, we're able to calculate that the bullet flies about 0.7 seconds to its target. Now, given the ballistics information we looked at earlier, that means the target is about 500 meters away. Now, if you look where the target's head is at the time we hear the gunshot to where his head ends up being by the time the bullet hits him, that means to me, the sniper was either anticipating where he was gonna be, which is highly unlikely, or this was a complete black shot or just not the greatest editing, maybe you should have just chosen a stationary target instead because that means the shot's a little bit more realistic. Oh. 
So the sniper just landed a 500 meter headshot. Here he's got Chris in his crosshairs, sort of obstructed by the car, but a part of his head protruding at about 300 meters given, again, by the time we hear the gunshot to the impact in this next scene. Spoiler alert, by the way, coming up if you've not watched the extraction, but at this point, if you're watching this video, then you've probably seen extraction. I really like the fact that they've given us the whole crosshair and everything. The scale is a little bit off given these breakdowns, especially if you look at the size of his optic he's running. He's not running a high magnification optic as I would personally on a dedicated sniper rifle. This is perhaps more sort of like a DMR rifle, a designated marksman rifle, sort of close to medium range engagement. But here he's got a clean shot on Chris and uh, he could have taken a clean shot right here. So instead of shooting him in the head, he puts a round sort of into the back of his body. And again, if you wanted to finish him, then he could have had a clear headshot right there. Maybe he was a little bit panicky because if I look at him and they show his face, he does seem like a really nervous shooter. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one thing I, I, I picked up on. He he seems super nervous behind this rifle. Uh, maybe he's not really a sniper guy. He's just sort of picked up a rifle and doing some work on the side. So as the sniper is about to put another round in Chris, his team actually fires back at the sniper. I'm super glad they didn't go through the bullet through the scope cliche. Again, we're gonna test that if our other video hits 30,000 likes. But spoiler alert, she takes out the sniper. However, Chris then takes a round to the neck. And as soon as that happened in the movie, I was like, oh, maybe that's a survivable shot. But looking back at it, AK-47 at that kind of range, you probably have so much terminal damage in here everything would be ripped apart. However, guys have survived crazy wounds going to war and stuff like that. So I wouldn't put it past him that he could have survived. Anyway, guys, that's kind of my breakdown for this movie. I appreciate you watching it. There's a bunch of people in the armed services also watching these videos. I know I see you commenting. Even though you're not serving me and my country directly, I want to thank you guys for what you're doing out there. And I want to thank the rest of you guys for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you have not done so already, make sure you're subscribed down below. If you want to check out two of our other breakdowns, you can check them up here. And if you want to support the channel at all, we'd really appreciate that. Check us down on Patreon and join the people of Impact on our private WhatsApp group. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one.